All right, recording's hitting. I think I need a new mouse. My button's not happy all the time. All right, we'll get you guys lifted up here. Get that chat window, there we go. Whoop, that's not that, a little big. You guys didn't see that, that's all right. All right, now I can see everybody. And there's the man of the hours himself, as Dave's hey. jumping on. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. Nothing but computer problems this morning. I know my mouse is being funny over here myself, so maybe it's something in the air. <laughs> Mine completely, my computer froze. Um, I had to restart it, and it took forever. So that was my deal. And then, of course, I go back to Safari, and I have to log into all the websites that I was logged into before because it closed me out. So that included Tradingology. Of course. Uh, how's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? Wow, look at this. Yeah, hey, we've got a few new faces wow. here. What's that? We've got a few new faces, look like, coming in. Nice, nice. Love new faces. Welcome. Welcome to everyone. I was just checking to see if anybody was uh, taking that fantastic trade yesterday. That was yeah. amazing. Yeah, that was, that was a beauty. That was a beauty for sure. Today is, uh, we had that hard landing, so we got a little bit of volatility going on, but it looks like we're still kind of moving lower here. Wow. I had a short position. I got out of it this morning at the open. So we'll kind of see what happens, but boy, it looks like it's going down. Yeah. Yeah, it really just turned the last couple of minutes here as I was getting the room started up. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Sham says he was expecting a reversal at the peak yesterday. Yeah, that's an odd one looking at the spreadsheet, right? Like as Dave was saying, the hard landing there. We went from a zero to a six. That's a big move. I have these big picture windows outside my office and there's a cat looking at me. <laughs> Where do you come from? Anyway, sorry, Andrew. We get so, tired. Yeah, so we got yeah really interesting stuff. Uh, you know, we looked at the peaks, the intermediate peaks in the bell curve. Uh, lots of them, lots of them on the positive side, and um, you know we had three intermediate term peaks there. The last one was plus twelve, and then all of a sudden yesterday we had a you know it was really good setup for a down day. I mean, just perfect. We went from a plus four to a zero. Uh, looked like it was really going negative. We had zeros in the first column of the binary trend. Um, yeah, beautiful setup yesterday. Uh, but look at the uh, fifth column, minus 2.3 after one day of being. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, holy cow. That's why you're probably talking to Sean there at the peak, seeing this as a peak where we might go back down. Yeah, and minus seven on the UD percent. So I guess there was a lot of negativity being built up over those intermediate term peaks on the positive side. And um, they took it all out on the on the market yesterday. Yeah, and then looking at what, uh, for those that maybe didn't see or weren't in the trade, so if I roll back to yesterday, we see this thing, uh, just a tiny little pop on the one minute, and then it just, rocking it down. I think this went down to about this far immediately at the open, just bam. And then it just continued. I can't even click it right. It's so crazy. So that one just kept going and going and going. I was out of it like here, I think, or here, somewhere around here. I got out. I was like, thank you. Because I was watching these typicals, right? For those that saw my email, you know, we're 0.4 in the first five minute bar. That's unheard of. Then just nailing those fifth columns. So this was telling me to jump out because as we like the strategy, right guys, we get the bulk of the profits and we run away and do the rest of our day. Yep, take the profits, take the profits, absolutely. So that was yesterday's fun, today was not as fun. Yeah, today was fun. I was actually, I, 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 I had a short position on that I left on and I got out at the open this morning. Um, 
right at right at the open. So I had a feeling it was going to go higher, and it looks like it went higher and then went down. Now it's going back up again. That hard landing from uh, you know the minus six there. Uh, that's really really tough to navigate. Plus it's the peak. Plus it's the you know, two percent. Now, typically, we go from peak to peak, so we go from a plus 2% to a negative 2%. If you bring up the spreadsheet again, let's see where that, I think there was a plus 2% on the last intermediate term peak. Yeah, back on the 23rd, so, you know, we're looking for that, um, we're looking for that next fifth column 2% level. We got it yesterday, and... Um, you know, but we've been in a, if you look at the binary trend, man, we've been in that, in that positive trend now for a very long time. Yeah, a long one there. You know, we're still getting the intermediate term peaks every three to f uh, five to seven days. Uh, but this one is kind of, uh, this is kind of a strange one because we went to a negative peak almost immediately. So does that mean we're going to go into a long negative stretch now? That's what I was trying to think. I don't think I've seen. I'll have to go back and look myself. Is uh, if this has ever even happened where we went straight to the peak on the fifth column in one day? Yeah, that's pretty From odd. A positive number. I don't know if I've ever seen that. I mean, traditionally speaking, if you're just long or short stocks, a very sharp move like that on a one day is a pretty good indication that it's going to continue in that direction but not without some volatility first. And I think we're seeing that this morning. We usually build up to it, right? We're seeing everything eight, seven, one, two here, both ways. We usually build to the peak. We usually yeah, just exactly. went to the peak. Yeah, it goes, you know, one, two, three, negative, five, negative, eight, negative, and then, yeah. It's like we got dropped off a helicopter right on the peak of the mountain there, bam. Sean says, yep, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, okay, yeah, he was thinking the same things. Yeah, maybe, but uh, I think what we're, I think this is just, I mean, this is total speculation because I really don't know what's going to happen, but what I, what I think is going to happen is that we're going to get, we're going to go from a minus six to like a minus three to a minus two, minus one, so we'll have a couple of positive days. And then we're going to go back up on the negative side again um, in a uh, kind of a fat tail. We'll see. Because only because the, the positive binary trend has been so long and we've had three intermediate term peaks. Um, if you look at the long term charts of the YMNQ spread, it has been in a downtrend since 2010. I think something like that, 2010, 2009. It's been in a downtrend for a very, very long time. Seven, 2007, I guess. Wow. There you go, there's 20 years. Yeah. Look at all that change, kind of meander, meander. Oh, now we get the moves. Yeah, now you can see, you can even see that the volatility has really started to pick up since 2016, beginning of 2017 there. Um, it's not as smooth as it used to be. And that's why, you know, when you do have profits, you, you know, you need to take those. Things. Exactly. We just put a microscope on and found the best place to take advantage of it. Yes, exactly. We'll jump back to a daily and put that one back. Now, in the book that Dr. Ziembo wrote on calendar anomalies, uh, he had a graph. Let me see if I can find it here. Let me know if you need me to turn the ball over to you. 
Yeah, I got to find it first. I cleared off my desktop and I think I put it in my trash bin by accident. <laughs> Funny when you say cleared off your desktop, it sounds like you're talking about physical for a second there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those lines are being blurred, aren't they? Yep. Yeah. I swept it right into the trash. It's in the recycle bin. <laughs> oh, I hate it when the mouse does that. I'm going to get a new mouse today. Maybe it'll stop doing this to me. I, I had an issue. Is it like jumping around on you without your permission? It's like it's double clicking when I'm just trying to click once. Um, That's a problem with trading. <laughs> yeah, mine was mine was moving without my permission. Oh, that's a fun one. <clears throat> we slide across the screen and it's like, I, I'm not moving. I'm not moving my mouse. It's a ghost. Sham is asking if your new script that you're cooking with it just probably leading right into uh, where you're going to help out in the tough situations. Yeah, I started coding it. It's not quite done yet, but I did start working on it. Um, yeah, so I mean, the basics of the scripts are uh, from an idea I got from reading uh, Dr. Ziemba's book. And the way he uh, the way he um, started to look at uh, calendar anomalies, which basically is the same thing as volatility arbitrage that we're using on a daily basis. Um, but he first noticed that there was a tendency for small cap stocks to outperform the S&P 500 uh, in December and January. Then he started to break down the uh, the months. And so what he did was he took the last four days of the month mm -hmm. and he noticed that there was a negative trend for the last four days of the month and then a positive trend on the spread between the S&P 500 and the small cap stocks in the first four days of the month. So there was an opportunity in those last four days and the first four days of the month to go positive the spread. Um, and he found that to be fairly consistent over years. I mean, he did, I did, he did a study for like 15, 20 years. Yeah, because he would put on like every December, right, or January when it turned out? It was, it was December, January, and then he started looking at every single month. And he found, the, and so he would do June, July, July, August, August, September, the last four days of the month and the first four days of the month. And he found um, uh, found some interesting anomalies in that. Uh, where is that? Don't tell me I can't. While he's pulling that up, Keith, yeah. The reason that I have the fifth column on the one minute chart is I will keep an eye on it and I will use it for exits. So if I hit the fifth column levels on the plus or minus 0.3, that's showing me that I exhausted a good amount of the potential move for the day. So I should probably look at exiting the position. That's the reason I have it on a one. I'll just keep an eye, if it ever hits it here or it hits it here, I keep my eyes out. Same as we use it on the dailies. So I just adjust the, over here we're at two and a half. So over here I adjust it to 0.3. You're welcome. Happy to help. Yeah. So the uh, the um, so the script <coughs> itself looks at it, it's not it's gonna I'm gonna be looking at just those last four days and the first four days of the month um, and see if there's an anomaly there that we can take advantage of. But we're, but I'm also looking at something else that he mentioned and that was that um it, in order to refine his bets so he defines his bets as you know based on 
based on certain anomalies that he found in the relationship between the small cap and large cap stocks uh, in the spread between, and it was, he looked at the difference between the cash index and the futures market. And so the script I'm working on is basically looking at anomalies between the cash index and the futures market. And he, he, he kind of uh, gave me the idea that <clears throat> when there's a large discrepancy between the two, um, there's a snapback to the fair value, the futures contract uh, snaps back to a fair value of the cash index. But sometimes the cash index was out of, uh, out of a fair value range and the futures market actually led it. So um, I'm working on that and I'm like, I can't believe I, I guess I must have um, deleted that chart. Uh, I'm gonna have to go back and see if I can find it on Amazon now because I took a screen capture from the book on Amazon. Yeah, just taking a peek at the index since you mentioned that. See how they're doing. They had a big rally to open, but they've kind of fallen off since then. Oh, all right, just both headed with this mouse. Sorry, guys. Nothing that won't drive you crazy. It's a mouse that doesn't click when you want it to. Ah, here we go. I got it. All right. What the ball? Hold on, just a second. Okay. It's taking pictures, it's getting fancy. Yeah, I want you to get a copyright strike if you. <laughs> I actually uh, had my book delivered on Saturday. Oh, did you? I got a, another fresh copy of it because I couldn't find my old one. It's yeah. it's thick. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a big book. Do you get the paperback or the hard copy? Paperback. Yeah. There goes our oscillator back down. Yeah, I, I didn't take the time to scan the pages in my book. I just went to Amazon and tried to do a, do a copy here. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if this is the one I was looking at. Well, hi, Mike. I'll mute you. <laughs> Sounds like Mike's driving in his car. All right. Yeah. Let me, all right. I'll uh, I'll uh, take the. Uh, take you the ready team. for the ball? All right. All right. So this is the chart that I was looking at. There's two charts here, but the, the bottom one is the one I was looking at. The top one. Um, it is a study that he did of the January effect going all the way back to 1926, which was kind of interesting. It was much, I mean, you can look at some of the dates back here in 1932 that the, um, uh, I mean, some of the moves are absolutely incredible. It's, I think it's the liquidity over, over the years that probably has reduced the spread uh, to the point where, you know, it's not as big as it used to be. But uh, the, the bottom one is the one that I find the most interesting. This is a, um, this is a calendar uh, difference in the spread over a 20-year, 20, 20, I think it was a 20, 25-year period 
And um, so January is typically a down month. February is typically an up month for the spread. So in other words, the S&P, the uh, small cap stocks are outperforming the S&P 500. And so I looked at June and June is a positive spread. And, um, and actually, if we look at the uh, spreadsheet again, it has been a positive month so far. Uh, where, the, well, in this case, it's the Dow and the NASDAQ. So to be fair, though, he's using the S&P 500 and the RTY, the, the Russell 2000. So the Russell 2000 should be outperforming, according to this, the S&P 500. Um, and then in July, it's negative. So anyway, this... So he used this over a long period of time. He said, you know, this is the way the spread performs over, you know, a 20, 30 year period. And you can see the December effect where the small cap stocks outperformed the S&P 500 by a large margin. And so what he would do is once he calculated and he, he, he gathered all this data to determine what the spreads uh, uh, performance would be over, you know, each, each and every single month, he would adjust his bet size, the amount of money that he actually put into the anomaly um, for that month. So if he knew it was gonna be positive, he would go long the spread in June, he would short the spread in July by a larger amount because the uh, typically it's minus a half a percent during July. And as we know from the YMNQ spread, a half a percent move is a pretty good move. Um, and, and, and so then the smaller months like August and September, he would adjust his bets to a smaller degree, knowing that the spread typically doesn't move that much in August and September. Then October, it moves again pretty good on the negative side, down below minus a half percent, excuse me. And then December, he'd make the really big bet. Uh, and this is the bet um, that he talks about in the interview with Chat with Traders. Uh, and it goes, you know, it goes to a 1% move. So the small, small caps typically outperform the S&P 500 by 1% or more in December, and uh, it terminates in January. Now, he had, it used to be, he used to carry over to January, but when he did a longer-term data, he realized that it actually reversed a little bit in January. So most of the bets now are in December, and then that's pretty much the end. So you guys can take a snapshot of that. Uh, I. It, it, this relates specifically to the uh, Russell 2000 um, and the um, uh, S&P 500, um, but we could also relate it to the Dow and the NASDAQ. And so part of the script I'm going to be doing is kind of relating those two to see if it actually, uh, see how well it performs and how it matches the data that he provided. So I thought that was interesting. Back to you. That is fantastic. Appreciate you pulling that up. Yeah. What page is that? I'll have to go research it directly in the book too. Do you remember? Does it say on there? Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah. Make it big now. I'll find it if you don't see it. It's, I don't know if it was right on that page or not. That's all good. No, I didn't get the, I didn't get the snapshot at the bottom of the page. It is on page six. Oh, right in the front then. Sweet. Right in the front, yeah. All right. Russell 2000 S&P 500 future spread average uh, returns various months. Uh, he did this from 1993 to 2011. So almost 20 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to match it up with um, I'll, I'll, do the, uh, I'll do the RTY S&P 500 spread on the futures contract and see if it still lines up pretty well with his data. Uh, but if not, even if it doesn't, it doesn't matter too much because he also gave a clue in the book about the last four days of the month and the first four days of the month um, as being kind of a very important time frame for the um, spread. So if you bring up the spreadsheet again, let's take a look at the last four days and the first four days of the month and see if we can corroborate his data 
and see if there's any anomaly there that we could take advantage of. So we got the last four days, 524 to 531, which were negative, generally. And then the first four days were positive on a net basis. So it went from negative to positive. Yeah, there's a 1.57. Oops. And what was our previous? Oh, stop doing that. See, it's my mouse. Or, yeah, almost a percent difference. Mm. 0.66 to 1.57. Yeah, so um, I guess that's something that we should, let's take a look at April, May. See what, see what happened in April, May. Your mouse. I know. Mouse. That one's point zero two of yeah. those four. Come on. <laughs> Killing me. Killing me, Smalls. And that was a negative point seven on the first front. Or the yeah. first four. So what do you I mean from what I understand, the, what, what he's saying is that the last four days are negative, the next four days and the first four days of the month are going to be positive. And if they're positive on the last four days, they're going to be negative on the first four days. So basically reversing, right? Yeah, yeah look at this. Here's end of March, all positive. Yeah. April Fools, we're all negative except for the fourth day. Yep. But you had a good two, three days there that it was, that was an over 1% move right there. Yeah. So yeah, that's something very, very interesting. That is interesting. I'll have to keep a very close eye on that. February didn't play nicely. That stayed negative. Maybe because it was a short month. And also looking at this curve was much, that was our four days in a row ones. I just loved that one. Uh, yeah, that was horrible. Yeah, interesting anomaly to check out. I like it. All right. There we go. I can see that again. So anyway, I'm going to try to build something into the script to kind of give us a clue of when these anomalies take place and when the shift so we can better time maybe some better uh, time the movements um, on these kind of like end of month, beginning of month, as well as maybe intra-month um, timeframes. Yeah, like a nice uh, medium to uh, longer term trade, like you're thinking like a swing or a longer setup. Yeah, exactly. But I, I have a feeling so far, I mean, I just started coding it. Um, and what I found is that there are times in which there's a, there's a, there's an unusual outside, outside of a, a single uh, de standard deviation move between the futures and the cash index. And I'm trying to determine when that happens, that typically triggers a move in the spread. And I need to find out if if that's the end of the spread or the beginning of the spread. Anyway, I'm yeah, still working on it. Sure. So we'll see. <clears throat> All right. So you've been having some pretty good days uh, scalping as well, haven't you? I'm telling you, ever since I got my hands on that hot little script, it's been a, a nice winning streak. Nice. Let's see, yeah, where's, uh, I haven't looked at that one yet today since we're doing this, or very, very shortly I've looked at it. Yeah, I had a couple up signals this morning. Uh, that was about it, at least the one I'm looking at. Oh, actually, that's. Again, so we can see instead of big mountains, looks kind of fun. Looks like you're traveling in the Rockies. Yeah, wow. Really wide, I've noticed uh, this morning with the big movement. Like you say, then we have less faith in those lines when they're so far spread apart. That yeah, when they're far apart. That there's something something going on there. That Nasdaq really dropped. Oh, well, Keith is looking for an ex explanation on hard landing. Ah. 
They do. What's interesting about that is that's probably a good question, Keith, because there's more than one way to get it. Might be the hardest thing for some people to grasp. Like today, he's talking about a hard landing where it went from a zero all the way up to a negative six, where you can also get a hard landing coming down, which more sounds like what we're talking about. It's usually just uh, basically a big move in my throat's getting dry, so I'll try to make this work. Is that, oh, I got water right here. Uh, another good example. A really good example is down below there when we went from, a, I think it was a two to a 12. Go, go oh, yeah. yeah. So that's the positive side of a hard landing, like going up it. We'll call those a hard landing. Maybe we should call them different so people understand the two differences, but they do kind of act the same way, right? So when it's a big move, like there's a two to a 12 or the zero to a six. So this is in the negative direction. This is in the positive direction. So they're both drastic moves. And a hard landing can also be like a six to a one, kind of. But it's like thinking about if you got the bell curve forming and all of a sudden it just flattens out, boom, it's like you landed a plane really hard. That's where the hard landing comes in, at least in my brain, that's how I think about it. Um, there was other ones where it's basically a move yeah, like much, any any move on the bell curve of four or more is uh, an unusual move, and so we're kind of cautious around those. Yeah, so like here's an eight to a two. Right. That was kind of a hard landing. Seven to a two. If we're looking back at it, so that might be what. So that's basically what it's. Uh, what we're talking about is we just need to have caution because. Whenever anything is extended, no matter what it is, it can't last, right? So that's why Dave's saying, you know, this could very well easily turn into a negative three here, a negative two day. We might slowly go down, whereas we kind of miss those on the up step. It almost like it fills in, kind of like the way the market doesn't like gaps and it likes to fill in its gaps. Sometimes the bell curve gets filled in too, I've noticed. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Interesting. Does that help, Keith, or did I just make it a lot worse? Yes. Look at it as a significant move, absolutely. Right. So, yeah, look at that. I've been watching these guys. Where's my – let's see if anybody's lined up with the futures at the same time. Because I watched the futures and the, the index. <laughs> Okay, we'll be here, Dave. <clears throat> How many of you guys have these? Doing any testing of your own, looking at the the intra intra trader script? Yeah, it looks like today we had one right at the open, matched up with a ribbon, positive BOP curve, full bullish earning. And MT ball was coming down slightly. So those were all kind of lining up as long as uh, you hit it right at the open. That was a pretty big move there. What did the contract do? 237. Not a huge move. Could have scalped a short one there in the first five minutes before that ended. So maybe when Dave gets back, they'll be like, here's an anomaly for a move on the index versus the futures contract. Because it definitely looks like it outperformed on the index. Or it started much lower. That's what it did. The futures was already up. And then what do we have after that? And we also opened up pretty high on the SDs too. 13. Looking at it right here. The strength was just under a 1.89. Same on the MQ side. Strong SDs, both sides. I didn't see that. And it looks like we kind of signal the cues. Intermix with the ribbons. That's the one thing that I'm cautious on later on through the day is uh, I do kind of like the way that's setting up though, but it's the, what I like less about it is the big gap. So we had a down signal. Get this in the view. BOP curve still going down. This current one is losing some hurting. Empty ball's barely ticking up. 
So it was kind of, that would have been a nice little short opportunity right there, or at least a potential for one. That's what I look at as, you know, how are we lining up? It's bouncing off that. It's, it's respecting that level. But it's tough. The one thing I do look at, and this also does actually play into it too. So even, and this is one thing that I believe people have a hard time wrapping their heads around until they use it long enough. I had the client tell me this is, uh, even though SDs are positive right now on this day for both indexes, we're coming down. So we're losing strength or supply demand. So when you see this in conjunction with now a potential down signal like we saw here, or so if those line up, just because I'm positive doesn't mean I can't take a short because I see where it's gone or where it's been to where it's going. One, that was like an aha moment for one of my customers because it was, yeah, if this is positive, I got to go long, right? No matter where it is. But it's like, no, it's all in relation to where it's been and where it's going. So we can see the market's weakening. And that was just an eye-opening moment. He told me as in an email he was writing me. So I love it when people have their aha moments. So that wouldn't, so this in, con, in conjunction with falling BOP curve, this is kind of telling us what's coming. I would absolutely look at uh, taking a short there, bouncing off that nice little level. That would have been a nice quick short. And that's how I've been running them. So uh, it's worked out fantastic. I've been doubling and tripling my goals on top of the, the ARP strategy on a daily basis since two Thursdays ago. I've had zero down days. That's why I'm, I'm a fanatic of this script and putting all these things together. It's great. Anybody else testing? I know a bunch of people got their hands on anybody in the room today that uh, is also looking, not that you've had to make any trades or done anything, but how is anybody uh, testing the script and how are you feeling about the intertrader script if you have it? And that's a great explanation of how to use it. Thank Absolutely. you. <clears throat> Did you set up the RX reverse uh, script as well? I do have that on my other chart because I always have more charts, right? <laughs> yeah. You <laughs> never have enough charts. I'm almost getting to the point where it's like, dude, do I need more monitors? <laughs> yeah. I just need to prioritize. Where did that one go? I got it somewhere here. Yeah, those I've used less so far. I don't have enough time in the seat with them. I got to find it. Where did it go? Yeah, I, I, with TOS now, with the scripts, what I've done is I set up uh, different groups um, in the um, workspaces. So I've got one workspace just for the ARB and I've got one workspace just for the uh, uh, scalping. Oh, gotcha. So I don't have to have like a billion charts up there at the same time. <clears throat> well, apparently I don't have that one. I must have moved it somewhere. Yeah, it's okay. It's just a, it's a, it's kind of interesting if you watch it over time. <clears throat> it's been at a relatively high level uh, above that 20 level that uh, we mentioned in the last trading room. Shot up very early this morning and started to come back down again. But it's been a fairly good and accurate indicator of um, the general direction of, of the market. Um, but, I, you know, there's there's something going on with the market that's kind of odd, I think. I think there's just no volume. Um, you know, and I was talking with someone about the average volume per share on the market timer spreadsheet. It's just been so low, and we've had these huge moves, but there's really no volume behind it. Uh, <clears throat> both on the downside when we had a down week a couple weeks ago, and then on the upside from last week. Uh, it's just very, very odd. It doesn't look like anybody really wants to commit to one side of the market or the other, but uh, the people that are committing to it are pushing it pretty high. And I got to tell you, I mean, after looking at all the data that 
Mark Hammer gets in for so many, uh, for such a long period of time. There's just a lot. I know you guys probably know this already, but the data confirms that there's just so much manipulation going on mm -hmm. in the market. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I created the spreadsheet for Market Timer in the first place and the volatility arbitrage spread was to try to eliminate that noise from manipulation. And um, because if you look at price alone, man, you get faked out so many times. You just get like killed. And so when you've got the SDs and the STs up, you can tell, you can actually tell when a move is going to, is real or not, because you'll see the volume and the supply demand go up as well with the move. And if it's not moving higher and the SD is moving down, like it is on the YM now, uh, that's, you know, that's a pretty big warning sign that, you know, that, that move is, you know, if it goes higher and the SD's going lower, that's a fake out. That's a total fake out. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it, it's, I don't know, it's just, uh, it's just very, you know, I, I guess it's just, you know, people who have lot, large amounts of money are just like, you know, they can push the market around pretty much any, any way they want uh, until volume starts to put, come into the market. When volume comes into the market and somebody really wants to get out of a big position and they're caught long, uh, they're going to be in trouble. So you get this pile on an effect of, um, you know, uh, traders who are just pushing the market around, see if they can scalp a few points and market makers, you know, doing the same thing. When big volume comes in, they all got to go short or they all got to go long. It's like a <clears throat> a bully can only last so long until the crowd stands up to him. Yep, and that's right. And so it's like we had the down week the dip the week before. Now we got the big up week, and that kind of price volatility with no volume is really a good indication that uh, uh, you know there's no commitment on either side of the market. And you're just going to experience a lot of volatility going forward. But the one thing, I mean, the reason why the volatility arbitrage spread works is because you're eliminating a lot of the manipulation in the market. You know, you're, you're saying, okay, well, if I'm buying, you know, if I'm going long the YM and short the NQ, it doesn't matter what each one of those do individually. You know, they can manipulate the YM all they want, or they can manipulate the NQ, but the relationship is what I'm trading. And um, uh, that's why it's also fairly well, I mean, much more predictable than the market in general. Right. <clears throat> yeah, if you ever want to compare it, just compare the spread against either one of the indicators. Yeah. I was, on, I was on Twitter and I had this argument with this guy because he kept saying that he was looking at the XRP PT, BTC spread, which is the, um, uh, the spread for, for those two cryptocurrencies. And he said, well, the spread for XRP BTC is going up. And uh, so he used that as an argument that it was bullish for XRP. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not at all. It's, you know, they could both be going down, but XRP could just be going down slower. Tell and me I have a masterclass for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did. I sent him over to Tradingology for a long <laughs> He's looking for the Bitcoin masterclass. I told him it's in preparation. <laughs> yeah, that's a joke, everybody. I said you gotta you gotta look at the you know the, just because the spread's going up doesn't mean they're both going up. They can both be going down. It took him a minute to kind of wrap his head around it. I still don't think he got it. Uh, Mike says I have a hard time playing, a uh, hard time paying close attention to all the various charts that my tendency is to fall back and looking at price action. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can look at price action, but you'll get faked out more often than not. Uh, the ones that I rely on, especially for the, uh, for scalping are the SD, ST, STs, especially the SD because that's the money coming into the market. Uh, the ST is just the velocity at which that money is coming into the market. Um, I like to see them both move down together, um, but 
you've got the SD that is, that's the actual money. That's the money. So if it's going down, there's, there it means that there's more selling going on than buying. And so you see on the NQ, you got that little move higher right around the 915, 930 on yours. Yeah, that one and that one. Both of those moves higher uh, showed that actually people were selling into it because the SD was going lower. I mean, if you don't look at anything else, at least follow the SD. So people who got caught long on that, uh, and I'm sure there's people who went, yeah, hey, this is a bullish move, we're going higher. Oh, the other thing that's really, really kind of quick, if you're just looking at price action, just price action alone, take a look at the highs and lows. So even on that five minute chart, if you take a look at that low point, the second, no, the one before that, the low point just before that, no, before that. Which chart are you looking at, NQ or YM? NQ. So go back to the middle one right there. So you notice that that low is lower than the previous low at 930, 835 there, right there. There's a, just a hair, I mean, it's just a hair difference. Yep. But that works out more often than it doesn't. When there's a new lower low on that, even on a five minute chart, even if it's by one tick, that indicates that it's going lower. And if we made a new high, even by one tick, then we're going higher. And if we didn't make a new low right there in the middle, and it was one tick higher than the previous low, that is a pretty good indication that we're going higher. So if you don't look at anything else on price action, uh, look at that and then follow the SD and you'll, you'll never get in trouble. Because if as soon as you saw that bar make a new low and then reverse higher, it's gonna cut out that low, it's gonna go lower eventually. And look at that, that's right at support at the, uh, what's that, the 30 minute bar? Yep. 50% 30? Yep. Both, both 15 and 30 are right there. You see the yep. dotted gray underneath there? Uh, so yeah, that's a double line. Yeah, so if you don't pay attention to anything else, look at the 50% on the 5, 15, and 30, and look at the price action making new lows or new highs. Uh, even if, and it's not a mistake, it's not like a, um, uh, accident that it is one tick lower than the previous low. It's not an accident. They had to fill all these orders. Yeah. Same thing as the new low you're saying there, it's also a lower high. Yep. Exactly. So lower high, lower low, lower high. Yep. Resistance. Stuff's going down ahead of the arrow. Perfect short opportunity. Yeah, it's no accident that it's, it's got a lower low there. So anyway, <clears throat> on a long-term vision, um, Market Timer's been updating everybody, saying that there's a there's a potential for a uh, February 2000 event to take place again, another 4% day down, which would be uh, 1,000 points on the uh, YM, basically. Yeah, it, it, the, the potential is there. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but the potential, the setup is there. Uh, it's possible. Especially with, especially with the, the long-term signal rounding down. Yeah. I watched that, and I was reading that as soon. It's like, ooh, that's an interesting one. Yeah. You know, what's funny is in, in that, in February 2018, I took the spread. I took the YMNQ spread. And the market dropped 1,000 points. And, um, you know, I think the spread was like maybe a half a percent or 0.6 percent or something like that. And, um, you know, so I ended up making money on it. But everybody, I had a couple of trader friends call me and say, oh, my God, did you see the market's down a thousand points? They said, well, I don't care. Who cares? <laughs> Not on me. I play a different game. Yeah. I'm in a different game altogether. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're about that time. So any last questions, let them rip. And I promise I will get a new mouse before Thursday because I don't think I would make it that far. I'm not going to make it through today with this mouse. <laughs> yeah, it's like the worst thing ever. Mouse no problems.
we were having a discussion <clears throat> yesterday, just texting back and forth about, you know, being overly confident in your trades because you've been on a winning streak, right? Yep, absolutely. That's why I'm, like we say, I'm confident, but not, I'm trying to be cautiously optimistic and uh, not get out ahead of myself. Yeah. But um, it, it, confidence, you have to have confidence in your, in your trading ability. And, and the confidence is not hubris. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not being cocky about it. Um, your confidence in your trades really comes from knowing that you're going to do the right thing when you need to do it. That's the confidence that you need to have. So if you're in a losing trade, you have confidence in yourself to do the right thing and get out. Um, so you got to have confidence. But more people lose money out of fear uh, of making a mistake or you know, not being sure about their trade or fear of losing money. Um, and that fear tends to perpetuate itself. So you lose one, you have a certain amount of fear built into that trade. You lose another trade, you have more fear built on top of that. You lose a third trade, you have more fear on top of that. But if you did the right thing in each one of those trades, you cut your losses and you got out when your signal told you to do it, then um, you did the right thing. So you should have confidence in yourself. Confidence comes not just because you're winning, but because you're doing the right thing. You're getting in and out of positions when you should be. Just uh, the college of trading. I guess. So we, got, we got the spread. Yeah, we're going higher now. See that hard landing, I think, is, is affecting it. So in the TSA alert, uh, uh, I did, I did, I don't know if I'll do this. Once in a while, I might do this. I might just post my trade. So I said I was getting out of my long YMNQ trade. So if you guys are not um, uh, getting the TSAs, I will post once in a while if I'm doing a swing trade on the YMNQ or I'm going to be looking carefully at the S&P 500 RTY trade as well. Um, and if I get in or I see something interesting, I'll post it to that uh, to the chat room. Okay. <clears throat> Excellent. You guys are more of a quiet bunch today. A few questions, but not too many. Okay, guys, we've got a couple minutes left. Anybody got questions? We're here for you. That's why we do these so that you guys can ask questions and uh, we're not just here to hear ourselves talk. We're here for you guys. Uh, Mark asks, do we have access to the chat room? If you're a, if you're a Val, Val R private client, you do. Or a member or a TSA subscriber also has access, obviously, since we're no longer texting them and they're coming across in that chat room is where they're being delivered. Yeah, the TSA alerts are going into that chat room because our, the tech service was extremely delayed and sometimes the messages didn't go out at all. Yeah, so you, if you sign up for TSA alerts or a private client, you definitely have access uh, if you're signed up for the TSA alerts right now. Because their private clients don't nest, don't have access to it unless they sign up for TSA alerts. But um, Mike's got the premiums. You know, <clears throat> just grabbed the premiums for Friday. How how low of a time frame can you go in the futures for the like the intra trader script? Are you talking, or you can put them on any time frame? I watch the five minutes, but uh, you can do one minutes if you want to. Like I actually have futures charts. I don't watch the intra trader script on a one minute. I'll usually only watch the SD and ST on the one minute, like during the open, because I like to see what's exactly happening. But uh, five minutes I'll use for these scripts and uh, all the other ones, I have those on five minute charts. All the, uh, where's my other, this guy. These are five minutes. 
Yeah, five minutes seems to be a pretty good time frame. I think um, one in, one minute would be a little bit too jumpy, but it works on five, 10, 15, 20, 30 hour, whatever. I, I found the lower time frame so seems to be better, like the five, the five, 10, 15. The 30 in the hours, um, I follow those a little bit, but signals tend to be a little bit behind. Uh, so I like the five, 10, 15. Definitely. Five minutes for sure when I'm, when I'm scalping. As Sean says, your swing trade at the end of the day, how long did it typically last two days? The one that we did in the middle of last week, that was, Dave actually closed his the same day because it moved so well that day that it was the percentage of it was time to get out, similar to reaching the fifth column level. So that swing trade actually lasted only a day or two last week, if that's the one you're thinking of, Sean. <clears throat> yeah, I took one I took one after the, uh, the uh, trading room last week, and then I took another one uh, Friday uh, when, after it went up. The spread went higher, and then I took another short after that. Uh, this was that day that we took it after the session. Then it moved all the way, and then Dave closed this one out. So this was the first one. Yep, and then I got back in Friday. Yep. It's been a nice down move. And what's the next one he's got here? If you went long at the end of the day on the ball arm and the trade went against you today, you try and wait it out until maybe that goes back in your favor. Oh, so if you get in, then you're wrong. My advice, if you get it on the wrong side of the trade, it depends on where you are in the bell curve. We always tell ourselves, but it completely matters because how long you may or may not have to wait or be able to wait to turn that back into a winner. If you're on, like if uh, something just happened and we had a peak to the positive side and for whatever reason you guessed wrong, now you might have to oh, wait an entire, like if you're long something, like you saw this and this went up and you're thinking it's going to keep going long and you got it long here, well, you're at the top of this bell curve. So if you're long and it goes against you, you're like, oh, I'll just wait a day. Oh, it went down again. I have to wait another day. You're going to have to wait a long time for this to come back. It will eventually but now you're going to be out of trading for a week or two. So it depends on where you are and how long you can wait is what my advice there is at least. Yeah. Expand that window out a little bit because you look at the uh, bell curve oscillator, it started going positive like two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. And if you were in a, you know, if you were in a short position back then, that was on five thirteen. Yeah, or before that, it started going positive. Look how long it's lasted. Now we're we're at uh, you know June eleventh. So you'd have to wait a month if you were short. <laughs> yeah, if you got short here and you were wrong, or you didn't, this wasn't enough profit for you for whatever reason. Then it started going against you. Yeah, you're waiting until here to be profitable. So that's where you say, yeah, it does eventually come back the way this oscillates. But now you're no longer trading for a month, and you've lost opportunities. Right. Right. So if you can live through that, then yeah, it all depends on where you are and what may happen in the future. Yeah, the most important thing on that is is do not take a long position when the oscillator is above that. What's that line you got there? Which one are you looking at? The yellow line. Eight. Yeah, so I mean, you know, if you're like in that neighborhood and you're taking a long position in that, in that neighborhood, you're going to end up waiting a long time. So yeah, you may never get back. If you, for some reason, like you saw this, like it went, if you look this day to this day, it went long and you're expecting it to go longer. You yeah. got really saved by this. Yeah. You're lucky. You were just really lucky. Never yeah. do that. Never do that. Cause that's the, that's the extreme. Yeah. See how normally if it hits it, then it goes the other way. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, at the very least, if you want to take a short position um, on those peaks, yeah, you might be able to get away with doing something like that. But I would always look at the bell curve uh, on, the, on the daily and look at that and say, hmm, you know, if we're, you know, if we're at 2.53% in the fifth column, 
on the positive side, you might want to take a short position, but definitely not a long position because we know that the spread typically will not pass the 3% level uh, on either side, plus or negative. So if you're taking a long position and it's already plus three in the fifth, phew, you know, you basically you're not giving yourself an opportunity to profit. Even if it goes up another half a percent, you're taking a huge risk. Right. Yep. And it's not that it's not that you won't make your money back eventually. I mean, if you hold on to it, you probably would. But the the issue is that you're gonna be, yeah, like Dan said, you're gonna be out of the game for a month. Possibly. And staring at a negative number think of what that does to your psychology yeah exactly so in in the, on the spreadsheet that binary trend columns are so important too because it kind of gives you an idea that hey if there's a negative trend starting and it's in the first and second column after a very long positive trend like we've had then the for the probabilities, there's a very high probability that we're going to go negative, especially after three peaks in the positive side. I mean, that was a, that's almost a no-brainer. Does that help, Michelle? Good, good. You're welcome. Mark says, what you're doing is extremely insightful. Followed market timer since February and a lot of studying and watching. Totally new to Ballarb. Learned so much with MT and love the concept of how you are executing with the everyday. You're welcome. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, you're welcome, Mark. All right, Asham, uh, glad to help. Okay, great. All right, guys. Well, thanks very much for joining us again. We'll see you guys on Thursday. Have a great day. Bob, Keith, have a good one. Absolutely. Appreciate you guys. We'll see you on Thursday. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye. See you, Dave. See you, Dave.